Hello YouTube. Today on The Naughty Librarian, I'm doing my mid-December wrap-up. So far my reading's been a little up and down. I would say it's been kind of mostly mediocre so far. So, so far in December, we're not flying very high, but it's okay. I, I read five books so far, and, and, and a few of them were, were very big books. Like, they were thick with two C's. They were big ass books, and I read them. <laughs> all right, so let's all get on the mediocre train and start talking about some books I have read so far in December. First category is sci-fi, and I read two of them. So, I read Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline, and this is the sequel to Ready Player One. I loved Ready Player One. It's very good. And so I was like interested to see what's gonna happen next. Like the end of the book is actually like a hot mess when you think about it. It was like a kid won a video game and now he owns a multi-million dollar multinational company that the whole world uses. Like what, you won a video game. <laughs> how do you know how to run a company? That's like a hot mess. And I was like, what happens after that? What is this kid gonna do? I thought like Ready Player Two was going to be that. And to an extent it is. But also, you have to ask the question of, who was this for? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. It's just, like, it's too much like its predecessor and too little like its predecessor at the same time. Does that make any sense? Like, uh, there's so much of the 80s trivia and nostalgia and deep dives in this that it's like cloying. <laughs> like the first book was charming because it's a, it's its own thing. No one had done that. It's very charming. Doing it twice is just like, yeah, we fucking get it. <laughs> like, stop beating the dead horse. We get it, guys. The 80s. <laughs> the 80s references were just cloying and I just found myself like losing focus and going, okay, when are they gonna do something? I don't need to know the whole plot and history of this director and this movie. I don't care about these 80 things. And it wasn't like its predecessor in the sense that it had heart and hope and a direct, like, goal for the main protagonist. <laughs> so this one is a bit more murky, I would say. It's kind of following Wade. And it makes sense because on the one hand, like I said, the ending of Ready Player One is a hot mess. It's just some kid who won a video game. And it's not like a normal, well-adjusted kid. This is a socially awkward, very socially awkward kid who, you know, grew up without parents pretty much, like traumatized. Now he's like the most famous person in the world and a owner of a billion dollar company. So it's like, <laughs> he's not all of a sudden gonna get over all of his trauma. He's just gonna be like the same person, but like in bigger, stakes so it's just gonna be worse for him exploring that character is an interesting choice um but uh, like i'll just say it he made wade watts into like a dick for like a lot of the book he's kind of a dick and like it makes sense why wade watts would be a dick for the, all of the above reasons all of a sudden this very awkward unpopular traumatized kid has all the money and power in the world like of course he's going to abuse it a little bit like you know, it makes sense for the character to do that. But the thing is, the audience, us as readers, we liked Wade Watts because Wade Watts had heart, <laughs> not because he was a dick. So you're just taking this character we really like and giving him traits that we don't like. So I don't really know how to feel about this one. I don't know, I, I, I just kind of was like, oh, it's that weird middle place where it's too much like the predecessor and not enough like it to be good. I don't know how I feel about it. I gave it the three stars. I read the, th the whole book. I, I don't think it's uh, terribly written. I just think it needed uh, direction. I don't know. I don't really know how to put it. It just, it wasn't giving me what I needed out of it. And I don't think I'm the only person who felt that way, but, um, but it's not terrible. I gave it three stars. It's average. It's an average book. But credit where credit's due, I do want to point out that there is a trans character in this book whose story arc has nothing to do with the fact that they are trans, which is so cool. Representation matters and it's not always about like, oh, I need to come to terms with my gender. It's just like, yeah, this person is trans because that's normal. Normalize it. So for that aspect, I want to give credit where credit's due. I thought that was very good and I'm, I'm proud of him for making that choice in the character. So for that, 
props, but otherwise, <laughs> Okay, you guys all doubted me on this one, but I freaking read Dude by Frank Herbert. I did it. I read the whole thing. <laughs> did I like it? <laughs> well, uh, okay, okay, I'll explain. So I gave it four stars because I acknowledge that this is some groundbreaking shit. Like, this was like so out of the realm of things being written in 1965 when this came out that it would have just blown everyone's freaking minds. Like, I get it. This is a very well written book. It's very deep. It has so much culture in it. Like, credit where credit is due. It's a fabulously written book. It's a very talented author. No one is like questioning that fact. The question is, subjectively, did I enjoy it? And the answer is, kind of meh. <laughs> so writing is a five stars, enjoyment is a three stars, so I split the difference at four. Does that make sense? I mean, there are cool parts in it. Um, I think this just comes down to personal preference in the writing style, where, um, I don't know, I wanted to have more of an emotional connection to these characters, which is strange because so many of the characters' inner thoughts are on the page, and yet I still feel so distanced from everybody. Is that weird? Am I just being a hippie or something? But like, I just felt like so distant from all the characters that I couldn't relate to them at all. So it just made it difficult to like get into the story as much as I wanted to. I wanted that emotional connection where I really wanted to root for these characters, but I was so distanced that like, I don't know, I just felt like an outsider the whole time. And like, it doesn't really have a good sense of direction either. Like there's so many chapters, like I was reading some of it, I'm like, oh, well they're cutting this in the movie, this is nonsense. <laughs> like, just reading the book going, you, you, you guys had a whole chapter of them trying to dig a backpack out of dirt. Like the whole chapter, they're, they're digging a backpack out. Like, <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's, it, it was very well done, but it's just like, do you need a whole chapter on that? We're basically following Paul Atreides and um, he is kind of the prodigal son. It's kind of Lion King-esque. I'm sorry. It, the Lion King is obviously not the inspiration for this book. <laughs> But I guess you could say maybe Hamlet was an inspiration. You know, it's about an intellectual kind of son who uh, his father dies and he has to kind of step up and be the man of the family a bit. So it has like Hamlet vibes in space. I, I'll give it that. Okay, maybe this is sacrilegious to say, but <laughs> actually that's a pun because um, is it just me or is Paul Atreides like kind of a dick? Like. <laughs> I really wanted to like this guy and I think if I had the emotional attachment to him and if he had a driving force, I could have liked him. But like the whole time of this book, he's just basically the spice makes him see the future and he keeps seeing this big jihad in his name and he's like, oh shit, like I don't want that to happen. But yet he does like nothing to stop it from happening. <laughs> He does all these things. He's like, oh, this will prevent the jihad. I'm like, no, it won't. You have made yourself into their, their prophet. Book three, this is three books in one book, and book three is called The Prophet. You've made yourself a prophet. You've made yourself a religious leader figure, head of these people. They're gonna do whatever you say. Like, that's where a holy war would come from because you won't stop making yourself the fucking messiah. <laughs> like, is it just me or did you just want to be like, bruh, like chill? <laughs> Ugh, like Paul, mm, okay. It's just like, all right, fine, fucking Paul. And, uh, and then it just ends. Like the ending is so fucking abrupt. <laughs> it's so abrupt. I, I can't describe it because the ending obviously is a spoiler, but um, it, it's just so abrupt and it just ends with nothing really resolved. It just kind of like, yep. That should have maybe happened three quarters of the way through the book and then you had a conclusion. This was just, it just ends and you're just like, wait, what? That's how it ends? That makes no freaking sense. So, um, my enjoyment level was mediocre, <laughs> but I do appreciate that it's a well-written book. Props for props are due. It's, it's a masterpiece. However, dude, I like it. Kind of no, I don't know, but I read the whole damn thing. So I'm accomplished, dang it. Next category is romance, and I read three of them. I read One Dance with a Duke by Tessa Dare, and honestly, I was worried about it going in. 
Um, basically, the Tessa Dare books published under Ballantine are hit or miss. When she started, when she moved over to Avon as her publisher, like, chef's kiss. My books got, like, infinitely better. <laughs> so this is one of the earlier works. So I was like, I was going in, hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. And I kind of fell in that middle. I gave it three stars. It wasn't terrible, but it was average. And I'll explain. This is Amelia and Spencer. Spencer is the Duke of Midnight. Basically, he goes to like parties every night at midnight and he dances a waltz with one lady and then leaves. He's all mysterious and shit. And then um, I, I guess Amelia, she had all these brothers and she's kind of like the impoverished nobility. And uh, her brother owes Spencer, the Duke of Moreland, the Duke of Midnight, a bunch of money. So she's like, listen, fuckwit. <laughs> like, I liked Amelia. She was really forceful and like spunky in the beginning of the book. And she's like, nope, you're dancing with me tonight. We got shit to talk about. And he's just like, uh, what? <laughs> and um, so from then on, there is an attraction. And like, it could have been sweet or, or or funny or something but like like Spencer he spends most of the book just treating Amelia like garbage like he's a dick not just like grumpy but he's like an asshole like he's an asshole I can deal with grumpy I can't deal with assholes and Amelia she's like oh I'm so sad he treats me like dirt but that ass though because he's so sexy <laughs> And I'm just like, girl, no dick is that good. Like, am I right? <laughs> and she just puts up with a lot of it. Maybe it's a, like a low self-esteem thing. I am not sure. Abelia starts the book real spunky and then just becomes less and less spunky as time progresses. And I was a little bummed about it because I was like, oh, she could have been cool. And then Spencer, like as time progresses, you start to understand him more and like, why he behaves certain ways and like that's fine I don't know the way that it's described is never like diagnosed in the book but he, it seems like he's on the spectrum like maybe he has like social anxiety disorder or, or something I don't know he has like some social disorder so it like how his brain works is completely like different than other people's because you know he's neurodivergent so that would make sense but there's ways to write that into the story without him being an asshole. <laughs> like, you know, he could be accidentally an asshole. Like, he has no self-awareness of it. He just does things and it's like, mm, I don't know. It just, it was, it's not great, okay? I gave it, uh, honestly, I think I gave it two stars now that I'm thinking about it. Like, it had its moments where I was like, okay, that's cute. I can get into it. And then I was like, oh, no, no, I don't. <laughs> So yeah, this was um, disappointing. It's okay. I love Tessa Dare still. There's so I love the vast majority of Tessa Dare books. Obviously, there's a few there's a few bad apples in the bunch, but it's okay. I'm gonna move on with my life. Continuing on the mediocre train, I read Midnight Sun by Stephanie Myers. Now this was slightly better than mediocre for me. Surprisingly, I think I gave it four stars. Why? Because I enjoyed it. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I like Twilight. I liked it. I haven't read it in years and I think if I read it for the first time now, my enjoyment of it m might not be there. I might have not liked it at all. But um, when I read it, I really liked it. So like I have like, these nostalgic memories of it. And Midnight Sun is basically Twilight but from Edward's perspective. And oh boy, like he takes brooding to like another level I didn't know existed. <laughs> Oh my goodness like boy you gotta let some of it out or you're just gonna burst like he is just like so pent up the whole time it's like oh my god go go take a walk I don't know you need to work off some of this Like he's just he's just so anxiety ridden the whole time and like I get it you constantly want to murder this girl you like that's a problem <laughs> and there's the thing like I think what I just said is a funny joke it's self-aware it's funny Edward has no self-awareness. There's so many jokes in here that could have been made and I would have like really liked Edward. He could still be super broody, but even he has to like admit like sneaking into her bedroom at night to watch her sleep like fucking Nosferatu is like maybe problematic. Like I wish he was more self-aware and was in on the joke kind of. 
Um, it's just, you know, he, maybe that doesn't work for his character. He's not really a funny character. But I would have liked him to be a bit more self-aware at times, because I think uh, the, the jokes would have written themselves, and it would have been very enjoyable. But yeah, you know what? I just like Stephanie Meyer's writing. I, and, and that's like kind of an acquired taste, I think. You either really like it or you don't. And I, I've read everything Stephanie Meyer's has written, and you know what? It's intensely readable. There's a reason why The Twilight Saga was a, you know, multi-million dollar international mega successful book. Like maybe it's not the best story, but hot damn, is it fun to read. So again, I just like the writing style and um, yeah, Broody Edward. And, and really you get to notice how dumb Bella is at times. He's just like, I am telling you, like I want to murder you. And she's like, I don't care, I like you. And he's just like, girl, like, girl. <laughs> Edward is really trying. He's like, I don't know how to make it plainer, but you're dumb. Like, I'll, you're gonna get murdered. Stop trying to get murdered. And she just won't. <laughs> so I understand his anxiety problems. I don't know, it was fun, whatever, I enjoyed it. Um, I liked it slightly more than average, so I gave it like 3.5 stars, rounded up to four. 2020 is hard enough, I round up. You know, it's what it is. Like, I wasn't expecting, you know, the Odyssey. I was expecting fucking Twilight again, <laughs> and I got it, so. If you just want to read something campy, teen angsty vampires, I recommend. It's fun. It's a fun trip down memory lane. Now, at the caboose of this mediocre express, I have one good book I read. I actually really enjoyed Crazy Stupid Bromance by Lissa K. Adams. This was a solid four, maybe 4.25 star book. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was well written and it was funny and I liked the characters and there's a giant cat named Beefcake. Like what more do you need? <laughs> This is Alexis and Noah, and Alexis, uh, she owns a cat cafe. She kind of has like a lot of stuff going on. Um, I don't want to get into it because it's plot points from previous books. And Noah was like a former hacktivist, and now he runs like a computer software security for firm thing. And uh, they're best friends. So it's obviously like friends to lovers. And Noah obviously is in love with Alexis. Alexis is obviously in love with Noah. You just wanna force their faces together and make them kiss already. <laughs> so it's about them trying to take their friendship to a romance. And you know, it's awkward and it's sweet and it's all the things you want out of that trope. But layered in there is also, uh, it's also a story about grief and trauma and um, forgiving people. <laughs> like uh, both uh, Alexis and Noah have like traumatic pasts with parents and the loss of a parent. And there's a lot of inherent anger in that, even though it's a sad thing, it's also, it makes you angry at times. So it's them dealing with their grief and how it affects their everyday life and like just getting over things. So it's also like, a really cool, interesting character study. And also, there's a cat named Beefcake. <laughs> Seriously, there's a giant Maine Coon. I recommend looking it up. They're like dog-sized cats. They're enormous and I love them. And it's a Maine Coon and his name is Beefcake and I just, I just love him. <laughs> when there's fun animals in a book, I immediately like, like it a little bit more automatically. <laughs> this one has so many fun animals and it has friends to leverage tropes. It has like a lot of like deep, heavy content as well. And you know, it's also like adorably smutty. I wouldn't say it's like super smutty. I would say it's like moderate smutty. It's a moderate smutty book. Like there's a lot in it, but it's not like all the book. I actually really enjoyed this. I am loving this series so far. I will read everything in it. All the books I've read of the Bromance Book Club series, excellent. I am having so much fun with it, so yay. One good book at the caboose of this mediocre express. It hasn't been a fantastic reading month so far. It's been a little, eh, kind of. But uh, I have a lot of cool books coming up for the second half of December that I'm really getting into. I got some holiday picks. I got like fluffy rom-coms. I'm excited, it's gonna, it's gonna be adorable. It's adorable. <laughs> Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, what makes a book mediocre to you? I don't know. Everyone has a different opinion. Like what makes a book kind of like, it was all right. What are your criteria for that? Let me know in the comments down below. 
If you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you want to see more videos, make sure you subscribe. And I will see you guys soon. Bye!